Well, we have the last presentation of the uh, of this day, and I will make a brief uh, presentation of Elder Lara Ferreira Filho, with, uh, whom is a, a PhD student of uh, of the University of Brasilia. I'm trying to to open the website in order to <laughs> to, to have your. Uh, Yes, now no, uh, I, I, I have it. So, Elder Lara Ferreira Filho uh, is graduated in economics by the Federal University of Minas Gerais. He also made his master in economics by CDPLAR in the uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais. He is a PhD, he's making his PhD in economics by the graduate program in economics of the University of Brasilia. His areas of expertise in economics, uh, with emphasis on, on public finance, economic growth, uh, economic development, and industrial economics. He is also uh, a re uh, researcher of the Strukturalist Development Macroeconomics uh, Research Group. Uh, since 2016, he works for the finance and control agency of the federal government. Uh, well, I think that that's okay. Uh, Elder will present a, a lecture about the Calder uh, visiting uh, ECLAC, the Economic Commission of Latin American and Caribbean, of, uh, uh, an event that many people did not know that happens uh, many of the Calder's ideas developed on the 60s uh, had a very clear connection with the Latin American structuralism uh, because of his uh, uh, work on the ECLAC. So, uh, Elder, uh, the audience is yours. I just ask you to not uh, go more than 20 or 25 minutes because uh, today we are very late, right? Okay, Professor Rayo. Thank you for your presentation and for the invitation, and good afternoon to all. Uh, I will present this paper that Professor Ray and myself were writing, Calder Visits ECLAC, an initial turning point in his ideas. First, it's, it's important to know that the Caldorian models nowadays are mostly uh, known for the relevance given to the demand side of the economy and the concern about the sustainability of the balance of payments in the late 60s and afterwards. But in previous Calder's works, like in the 50s, we can see some difference of method as he used to apply equilibrium models to analyze process of economic growth and also of substance about the factors which would explain economic, economic development. About the role of the exchange rate, Calder has uh, some skepticism in the 60s and in the 70s, but then he became uh, enthusiast about using exchange rate to promote export growth. And then later in his career, he became again skeptical about the role of the exchange rate on that. But this change that I, I introduce here, is changes is stand out uh, for Calder because initially, Always he was curious and finding new evidence and uh, data about the economic process, but these changes occurred in a very interesting way. But it's not very uh, common that people know that Calder visited ECLAC in 1956 to produce initially a uh, work about the Chilean economy. Parts of the work were published years after because of political matters in some elections on Chile. And also, Furtado was inv invited by Calder to go to Cambridge, which he did between 57 and 58. In short, the main object of the artist analyze these changes in Calder's views throughout his career and discuss the possibility that the contact with ECLAC and its economists and members and researchers had an important role in the evolution of his thoughts. First of all, we will see the early contributions of Calder in the, uh, until the beginning of the 60s. Calder was born in Hungary in 1908, and between 27 and 47, he studied at uh, 
the London School of Economics. Initially, he was very influenced by Hayek's and Robbins' ideas. He could indeed be considered an orthodox in the late 20s. At the same time, however, Calder had contacts and was influenced by Alan Young, the one that created uh, or focused on the increasing returns theory, which was later applied as a central piece of Calder economic thought. After the period of in LLC, Calder stayed two years at the Economic Commission for Europe, then finally moving to Cambridge University. Calder thought it was necessary the direct observation of reality, consuming statistics and of, of other economists, economists, but also being driven always by creativity and curiosity. Ken's general theory of 36, of course, had a big impact at the time, and also for Calder. For instance, in, ter in his 38th paper, he points out that there, there was no natural tendency for full employment. But this assumption was left behind in the late 50s, when they developed some of his growth models. That was because we were living in the golden age, and the economies were booming, and still the employment were, uh, there was actually full employment. So the full employment situation was for him then uh, an stylized effect. Stylized effect. In terms of methodology, Calder showed the combination of his stylized effects that we know and some ideas from Milton Friedman, as he defended the as if method in some of his papers in the at the time. Indeed, until mid 60s, Calder worked on semi and formal steady state models, which included assumptions that seem like no classical one, as we'll see later. Though with some difference, there are some differences that will stress out. The models of 57 and 58, for example, wanted to con contribute to the debate about why some countries grow so much faster than others. Like the recently published model of Solo Swan, Calder uh, points that the critical factors of determining the potential output are saving propensities, innovation, and growth of population. So, neoclassical assumptions. The system is stable only for employment, also in both models. But Calder defends himself. It may seem paradoxical to label a model Keynesian. However, Keynesian apparatus of thought can be applied to full employment situations and not only to underemployment situations. An, invest an investment leads to saving, rejecting the view that capital availability could constrain growth. It's curious that quote, quote to, uh, from Calder. It certainly appears more correct to assume that output at any time is limited by the scarcity of resources rather than by effective demand. In his 58 model, Calder even used the representative agent he called a replica of the economy as a whole. However, Calder shows a clear discontentment about the neoclassical way to express technical progress because he saw part a large part of it was embodied technical progress. That is, he, crit he, cr he criticized the shifts in productive function functions that are related only to change in output and capital. Calder 62 is another paper that basically continues the, his previous works in the 50s. There are lots of uh, assumptions like passive role for savings, steady technical progress, exogenous rates of increase in the working population, and so on. But there are neoclassical assumptions and there are not so, so much neoclassical assumptions. For instance, he doesn't use uh, a quantity of capital and he doesn't use to the, the production function that neoclassical econom economics uh, use uh, commonly. But technical progress is the main growth, engine of growth. In some about this model of 62, Peter Scott said in, in his paper of 89, fundamentally, it's a neoclassical model. Then moving to the top, when we talk about the visits of Calder to Eklak, we, we start to say, well, through the decade of six, the 60, uh, Calder changed many pieces of his own economic thought. But why is that? A possible factor is his contact with Eklak, and its members. Calder, Calder visited Eklak in 56, like we said, and was invited by Prebisch at the time. 
initially to advise institutional fiscal policies for developing economies in the region. However, he ended up conducting uh, a study about the Chilean economy, which was only partially published in 1957, like we said, because of uh, uh, elections problems, elections concerns. In 1956, Calder still visited India, China, had other lectures in Japan, United States, and had short stops in Peru and Mexico, lots of American countries. Later, he went to Brazil, giving several lectures, including lots of topics, including, for instance, his first formulation to the link between agriculture, industrialization, and developing countries. In Chile, he also gave uh, lectures, never published, including the principle uh, of commutative causation later. After that visit, Celso Portado himself was invited by Calder to go to Cambridge, which he did in, in 57 and 58. Indeed, it was the period when Furtado wrote Formação Econômica do Brasil, The Economic Growth of Brazil, one of the, or, or the best uh, work uh, by a Brazilian economist, maybe. During the 1960s and others, Calder focused on external factors of Latin American development. He wrote two more articles for, articles for ECLAC in 63 and 64, but when he became the economic advisor to the labor government in the UK, he ended up reducing his visits abroad, including to Latin America. However, he continued to write about Latin American economies, particularly on the role of exchange rate on development and on the role of industrialization on development, like in Calder 1974, for instance. The model of 57, uh, the paper of 57 for the Chilean economy, Calder was trying to understand why the country could present a disappointing performance of growth, despite its high potentials, in Calder's view. The answer would lie in the low private savings by the capitalist class, because um, in, in an unusual way, the capitalist class was consuming luxury taxes a lot more than was expected. Also, he points that the Chilean persistently high inflation rate was an obstacle for development in the country. This high inflation rate was resulted from the capacity constraints, mainly in the agricultural sector, which produced an initial pressure on prices that were propagated with strong inertial mechanisms, commonly seen in the region. Calder realized that he would have to treat Chile and also other developed countries, of course, differently compared to developed countries. A typical ECLAT idea. The theory of income distribution uh, that Calder had for developed economies should change dramatically when applied to the less developed ones. It's incredible to notice that Chile had an incredible unequal income distribution, but still a low investment rate. So the prescription would be for this, these economies changing the its system uh, taxation, including incentives to make firms retain more resources to reinvest, and also to restrain uh, the luxury consumption by the, the capitalist class. Calder in 57 did not follow a class, classical plea, however, about the importance of economic problems originated outside the country, such as the negative international division of labor, the unequal distribution of the end of trade, and so on. He still focused on domestic problems, as we see, the taxation and the inflation. Perhaps saw the necessity of a rapid industrialization as a prerequisite for development. For ECLAC, the, the comparative advantages could be acquired. It's not something static, like in models like uh, Heschecker, Olling, and Samuelson. And of course, the drivers of economic growth are not the ones stressed out by the neoclassical solo swan growth model, but uh, however, it's industrialization and uh, in terms of uh, ECLAC's terms, it's a structuralist change in the economy. Other ECLAC's idea, which is also presented present in Calder 57, as we, as we saw earlier, is the persistent high inflation rate and the origin of that, the structuralist view on inflation. That is, therefore, 
there are some some elements of Heckler in Calder's reasoning since his visit in '56, which were incorporated only in the, his models of the '60s. Also, part of Calder's methodology probably has been influenced by Heckler as well. Uh, from the second half of 1960 and onwards, Calder elaborates his economic thought in what we called uh, a historical methodology without formal models that he used to use before. Of course, other aspects were important for Caldor change, like the growing literature of development, Lewis, Murdoch, Rosenstein, Rodin, Nurtsy, and others. Or even the start to contest with the beginning of the NWD age and the uh, unemployment that uh, came after with inflation. And during the 60s, Calder became increasingly dissatisfied with formal macroeconomic models by his own empirical research. He is not quiet, he's not stable, he's always looking for new solutions and new ideas. There was an excess of aggregation for him, and the assumption of growth constrained by the supply side was implausible and failed to show a proper pattern of development. Now moving to the last phase of Calder's economic thought, we have his paper in 1966 that he, Calder wants to try to solution uh, why Britain had this low economic growth rate compared to the other econ uh, developed economies since 1950. For some economists at the time, the difference in the economic performance for Britain would be explained by the quality of institutions, education, the level of creativity of the population, all some uh, theory that we see still today. However, for Calder, these this factors could facilitate growth, but not drive it. For him, actually, the rapid economic growth episodes are associated with the fast growth of the secondary sector, especially more, 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 more even more for developing economies. Therefore, in Eclat's terms, Calder is defending a necessary structural change. The manufacturing sector, as we know, has a high productivity and tends to attract labor force for own, from other sectors with low productivity. And its technical progress is also higher, which are benefits from the sector. In his models of 66 and 6, in his papers of 66 and 67, Calder said that the answer, uh, because of the relation between manufacturing and growth, is because of the increasing returns theory, especially in manufacturing. Uh, a theory that was said by uh, Smith and Allen Young and other classical economists, as you know. Productivity grows in response to increases in total output, indeed, because of economies of scale. That's what we call today Verdun's law. In the intermediate level of income, the process of import substitution is of great relevance, says Calder. This is a point also present in Eclat's ideas, but with a slight difference, difference because Calder would stress that it's important to, to promote the exports, particularly the manufacturing exports. This last point seems to be the result of a process of considering some of Eclat's ideas, analyzing them relativity relatively to the facts and to the data, as Calder used to do in his reasoning, and take on his own conclusions. In Latin America, it's an important quote for, from Calder, a curious one. In Latin America, which have experienced fast growth for a period, but which have failed to maintain the pace of development for very long, whereas in Japan, for instance, expanding its capital goods export enabled the phenomenally high post-war growth rate showing Calder's interest on Latin America experience also. There is the so-called the calder Verdun law, that the acceleration of export growth would lead to the more demand and more income, which would increase industries' productivity with spillover effects to other sectors' productivity, promoting another round of export acceleration. Calder in 6-7, List some possible constraints for economic growth. That is, if you, a country is importing more than exporting, 
eventually the country will face a balance of payments problem. Also a typical idea supported by ECLA. Interesting enough, he expanded this idea to the developed countries too, as United States or United Kingdom, Kingdom would be uh, would have benefits to expand exports to. Felder did not see the exchange rate as an option at the time to re relax these constraints, following to a traditional ECLAX idea. For him too, savings cannot be a constraint, uh, differently from uh, later in his uh, earlier in his career, the investment leads to profits and savings, and the cons legal constraint can exist, but only in special conditions, because the majority of countries possess l surplus labor in agriculture or informality or in services. He agrees, Calder agrees partially with Eklak on the necessity of high import tariffs. But for him, only in special uh, moments, in special states of development, and in a Lysian manner, because he defends only for infant industries and for a determined period of time, because of his focus on exports. And discouraging exports would be a negative for uh, economic development. Again, uh, it's important to notice that Calder makes clear uh, his concern about Latin America in his quote. Chile, Argentina, and Brazil each went through a phase of rapid growth following the establishment of highly protected tariffs or import prohibitions during the Great Depression, but was followed by a prolonged period of very slow growth and violent inflation. Some years later, in 71 and 72, Calder argues against some of his own previous ideas. In terms of substance, Calder uh, changed his perception of the importance of the exchange rate of increasing exports, seen as a legitimate and indispensable part of the international adjustment process. And the method he used to use, to use his own first studies, uh, the equilibrium economic laws, totally refuted, mainly in his 85 article. In 72, defense finding regularity based, based on empirical evidence and discovering testable hypotheses capable of explaining this association, a different method he used before, the as-if method. For Calder, the scientific rigor commands that if the theories do not fit the facts, the theories need to be abandoned or at least modified. In the neoclassical economic theory, basic assumptions are unverifiable, says Calder, like, for instance, profit or utility maximization, or not supported by facts, like perfect competition and perfect foresight of the economic agents. Calder 672 uh, also criticized the use of complex mathematical models and econometrics. For him, the vital mistake uh, with economic theory has been the complete neglect of the existence of increasing returns and its consequence on the economic framework. With increasing returns, indeed, the, notion, the proper notion of equilibrium becomes meaningless. And free trade is also affected, affected with this. As it could be not beneficial to all nations, uh, potentially. In terms of the importance of exchange rate, he goes back in the later uh, stage of his career to a more skeptical view, like we see before, and supported by ECLA. For him, there were known price advantages, and not only price advantages. So he presents two practical difficulties for major currency devaluations, like the reduction of real wages, and the impact on domestic uh, inflation. Now, concluding uh, my presentation, I would say that Calder was always concerned to check if the theories have some connection with reality. Initially, he was an orthodox economist, as we saw, but this changed with, his, with the influence of Keynes' general theory. Then, with the golden age, saw, Calder saw full employment as a stylized effect. At the beginning of his career, he worked with models, formal models, Besides, in terms of methodology, he explicitly defended the as-if as method, not necessarily paying attention to the historical context, like the members of ECLAC, for instance. Finally, the drivers of economic long-run growth, for him, were on the supply side, and not on the demand side or other things. 
What could have driven this change of color, we ask? We saw that the color was uh, eclectic in 56, and Furtado Cambridge in 57 and 58, and Calder was always interested in uh, Latin American countries, giving several lectures there. It's possible to acknowledge that the possibility that this visit have an, had an important role in Calder's change of view later. In terms of relevance of the exchange rate in order to increase multifactor sports, Calder shows uh, in 67 and 78 a very similar skepticism as the one traditional in, by Eklak. It's interesting to, to know, too, that Cal Calder always uh, cites many times the experience of Latin American countries. We can potentially be another hint of the impact of Eklak and these countries on him. Finally, has Calder has some destructive statements about the equilibrium economics, mainly because of increasing returns, and changed his method of FASIF to a more historical approach, like Eklak would do. It seems clear that uh, there are some, not all, Eklak's elements, which were introduced in Calder originally since 66. Maybe this visit made Calder go back to some of his other influences, like Lee or Young, and we know that an evolution of thought involves other aspects. And in Calder's case, we say, for instance, the growing literature on development and the historical context. However, the fact is Calder changed dramatically his view on equilibrium economics, which was a change of method, and also changed his view about the engines of economic growth. For him, industrialization was the main one. Even for material economies, that's a classic, a classic, a classic idea, except for Calder that he stressed out the importance of export promotion. Therefore, it's highly probable that his visit to Eclat had some impact on evolution of Calder's work, maybe like an ignition to a change of direct direction. In addition, researchers are always exposed to many ideas and news. It's common that an idea seen earlier to appear forgotten until someone brings it up again and incorporates in some model or some new theory. Merton has a a good quote on that, that the signals provided by discovery are lost in the noise of the great information system that constitutes science. And only after some time, it's incorporated the influences or influences a topic or an author. Of course, our paper is not fully concluded. concluded. Indeed, we are, are reading the, some correspondence between Furtado and Calder, and there are some hints they had ideas exchanged that could potentially uh, have influenced each other, both. I appreciate for your attention, and thank you all. Many thanks, Elder, for your uh, brilliant presentation. I'm seeing here in the chat uh, of the YouTube, Virginia Gina says, this lecture topic is very interesting, excellent presentation. M. Freitas also say good presentation. Uh, Gabriel Porcelli made uh, an appointment. Uh, uh, Gabriel Porcelli says, very interesting, Elder. I agree that Calder stressed the importance of manufacturing exports before most economists in Latin America. I would note, however, that already in the early 60s, Prebish warned against excessive protection and called for overcoming the phase of import substitution. Uh, there is an, also a comment of Luis Fernando de Paula, just one brief comment, Prebish in his 60s works showed that besides import substitution, policies oriented to exports were, imp or were important to overcome balance of payments constraints. So uh, there is the comments from the audience. Uh, I, I will take the chance that we are now alive and, and uh, uh, we are authors of the, both authors of the, the article, and uh, say that uh, I think that, well, uh, for uh, everybody to know, we have a, a, an extensive exchange of emails with Professor Anthony Thiro, uh, who is the, the biographer of, of Calder and is probably today is the most important uh, post-Keynesian schooler in the world. Um, 
uh, Professor Tiro uh, shows a little uh, skepticism about uh, the influence of Eclat over uh, Calder's economic thought. Uh, he, for for Tiro, uh, we have just a nice speculative arg uh, argument with a uh, little uh, historical uh, basis uh, to, to affirm that Eclat had an important role on the changes of uh, Calder's economic thought uh, in the mid 60s. But regarding of that point, I think that we have to insist on the paper, uh, basically two things. Uh, in the 50s, there is anything in Calder writings or in, in, in the, the uh, Cambridge School of Economics about two subjects. One, structural change. Two, balance of payments constraint. So this, these things appears in the Anglo-Saxonian word uh, by the hands of Calder after the middle of 60s, after he uh, had visited Eclat. Uh, and what I think that I, I did not read the 66 paper, but I read the 67 lectures of uh, Calder uh, delivered in the United States, that it, which is called the strategic, strategic factors of economic development. And he made uh, the, 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 the 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 issues that he raised in, in this in this 67 uh, paper are very near to to the Eclax uh, traditional position. First, he affirms that industrialization is the engine of growth. First, second, he affirms that the first stage of industrialization is import substitution, but in order for the industry realization to continue, it has to be succeed by uh, export promotion. He, he divides the industrialization in four phases. The first phase is the import substitution of, uh, of final goods, uh, basically consumption goods. Then the, the second phase was the export promotion of, uh, of uh, consumption goods. The third phase will be import uh, import substitution of capital goods, and finally the fourth phase, where all the, the high-income countries is export uh, promotion of capital goods. So, uh, uh, well, these ideas uh, Prebis had already expressed it. So, so, uh, uh, one criticism of uh, uh, Prebis made early in his 1949 paper on the first lecture uh, that he gives in the for the, the Eclat in the year that Eclat was founded is that there are limits to industrialization of uh, Latin American countries and the limit is because the, the markets are very thin and so it was not a good idea to every Latin American country have all possible industries. They must speci specialize in some manufacturing industries and then have regional trade uh, in order to increase the share of market for each one. So that's why Hal Prebish was uh, very optimistic and uh, was very uh, was a strong defender of Latin America trade integration. So I think that uh, these ideas uh, embed uh, Calder's thought. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, near uh, uh, about uh, with uh, Eclat's position. Of course, that ideas are public goods. You know, it's no uh, what is a public good is no exclusive and no um, uh, what's the other feature. Um, non-exclusive and uh, no rivalry. There's no river and no non-exclusive. So once you have an idea and you publish it, well, everybody has access to this idea and can say that it's 
his own idea or or not or just uh Leonardo Ponzo uh once told to me that um there is a, ideas are on a cloud and people access the ideas on the cloud and use it for developing their own thoughts so maybe uh we can make uh, less stronger uh, uh, affirmations about the influence of a clock over how the economic thought because ideas are, are public goods so uh, we can we can never prove who is the father or the mother of an idea uh, uh, Luis Fernando de Paula was asking but who have the original idea Calder or Prebish uh, in terms of time shadow Prebish is it's absolutely uh, 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 guaranteed that the I the, the first the idea that economic development depends on industrialization uh, uh, is is present on the the first document that Prebish presents in the first section of the ECLAC in 1949, and it is in English. It's important. The, the document was translated to English. Uh, it's not pu published in, uh, in any journal because it's, a, as a, it's an internal uh, document uh, for the United Nations. You know, remember that uh, ECLAC uh, is, uh, uh, is connected with the United Nations, is the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin American and Caribbean. So there is no excuse uh, for anyone to say, oh, I do not know that he write that because it is in Spanish or is it in Portuguese, not uh, in the, uh, not in English, which is the language that every good economist must uh, write. The, uh, that's, this paper was written in English and of course in Spanish. But I think that uh, uh, the, the idea of, industrialization as the engine of growth is a Latin American idea. Uh, that, that's, that, that as a structuralist, a Latin American structuralism idea. And uh, I think that, yes, Calder was influenced by that. And he simply takes this idea to the Anglo-Saxonian world uh, and uh, completely change his uh, ways of thinking on economic growth um, because if you uh, read his staff on economic growth is uh, basically his 1957 economic growth model which is the, the consistent mathematically consistent model the 61 62 model with Merlis is no consistent there is no internal consistent uh, Peter Scott has already proved that but in the uh, 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 57 model, there is no structural change at all. Uh, what uh, Calder introduces was a technical progress function where the rate of change in, in labor productivity depends on the rate of change of capital per worker, but in a steady state, the rate of change of productivity will be fully determined by the parameters of the productivity, the technical productivity function or technical progress function. Uh, and uh, on contrary, that Tiro uh, says to us in the, 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 the correspondence, uh, it's not true that on that model, the, the natural rate of growth is endogenous. Now, the natural rate of growth on model uh, on Calder's 19, 1957 model was not endogenous. It's at maximum, you can say that is semi exogenous uh, because uh, the natural rate of growth is determined by the parameters of the technical progress function, but is independent of investment and saving behavior. So, uh, effective demand has no role in the uh calder's 1957 uh growth model so that's uh, effective demand only appears only appears in calder's thought 
on economic development in his 66 and 67 lectures. So it takes 10 years for uh, Calder to change from a mainly supply side model, economic growth model, to a demand led growth model. And we can speculate, maybe, that this change uh, has something to do with his visit to Eclac and his contact with both the ideas of Raul Prebisch and Celso Furtado. And uh, I think that we have to stress this point. But uh, now seeing your presentation, I think that the, the issue of the methodological stuff of Calder can be simply uh, cut out of the paper because it's not relevant for the issue under discussion, is, which is the influence of ECLAC over Calder's conception on economic development. So the, the discussion on uh, equilibrium and the criticism of, of neoclassical general equilibrium theory uh, was not relevant. Uh, Prebers do not like uh, neoclassical economists, e economics, but because uh, he was thinking about the, the Ricardian uh, trade theory, so and uh, and Hatcher-Oling models, so on and so forth. I think that Prebers do not uh, had the knowledge about uh, the theoretical knowledge about uh, general equilibrium models in his latest form. Is Zero de Bre, uh, models of general equilibrium. So I think that that part of the paper we can simply uh, uh, cut, cut out and concentrate uh, on the 66 and 67 uh, papers of Calder and the relation uh, with the prior ideas of Prebisch, which are published much before the Calder ever thought on this subject. Do you have anything to comment, Albert? Yes, just to say that, uh, of course, it's important, uh, it's impossible that we know for sure that uh, Eklak had some uh, influence on Calder. Indeed, because it, it was common at the time that uh, the authors did not always cite the, the sources and so on. Uh, Including, for instance, uh, Prebish himself was always bothered because he did not formalize his model of the uh, uh, legged uh, sector and the center periphery, periphery country. country. Yes, yes yeah. because it's very similar to the Lewis paper that later was nominated uh, at the Nobel Prize. So, uh, yes, the, the problem is that Prebish never published it in a uh, respected journal. So yes. he, he could, if he had published his ideas that he had in the 30s about center periphery, he, if he had published on the American Economic Review, maybe Prebisch will be the first Latin American economist to win the Nobel Prize. So, uh, but unfortunately he did, did not publish uh, on the journals that are considered uh, respectable for the scientific community and because of that he did not win the Nobel Prize but I think that uh, he deserved it and it's a pity that he did not win the, the, the Nobel Prize. For me how Prebisch is the greatest Latin American economist of all times and that's why uh, how Prebisch won of the patrons of this research group. Yes, and in terms of methodology, Professor, um, the fact is that he used it to use the as-if method and then became more uh, like a historical approach. And he, he also emphasized the difference between developing countries and developed countries. So I think... Uh, this we can as make as a link with the Prebisch method. Yes. This is important to talk about Prebisch method and the the change in the method of Calder. I think that, that that's important. Uh, Get the, the, our paper published in a respectable yeah. journal, not only in a conference. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, but uh, Elder, many thanks for your very nice presentation. Uh, thanks for you all that are still together with us. And remembering that tomorrow will be the last day of this workshop. We will have a beautiful keynote speech made by Professor Jesus Ferreiro from the University of Basque Country that will talk about fiscal policy and its interaction with long-run growth. Uh, and then we will have just one graduate section uh, where Professor Julio Fernando da Costa Santos, uh, that is professor from Federal University of Uberlandia, will present uh, the uh, stock and flow consistent modeling as an alternative uh, for new developmentalism to develop it formally uh, its ideas. So, uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, have a, for, for, now for Brazilians, have a, a, a good afternoon. And uh, uh, for Europeans and uh, our European guests, have a, a good night. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.